the victims of the lives lost, the lives cut short, will never be able to pursue or realize their dreams. And uh, so sadly, uh, two of them I, I noticed were, were older, or sorry, younger than my oldest daughter, mm-hmm. and you know, full lives ahead of them. And um, you know, it, it's also a time of, of anger and frustration for me for for actions not taken, actions that we could have taken, should have taken uh, at the national level and other states. Um, when it comes to addressing gun violence. And this can never be seen as normal. It's it's sickening, it's disgusting, it's unacceptable. It, it, it cannot be, and it is unique in uh, the world, in the United States. The United States is the only place that has uh, what I call America's disease, this, this epidemic of gun violence. And so we need to continue to do what we know works and build on that, uh, driven by evidence and data and outcomes. And we are doing uh, those things at the California Department of Justice. We are a leader in California, uh, and we must do more. Before we dive into the details of what you're working on, uh, let's pull back a little bit and look at the big picture. Anecdotally, it feels like it's a lot worse in terms of gun violence and deaths. Um, but tell us, what are we seeing data-wise here in California? Has it really grown dramatically worse? There have been some rises in some crimes, including violent crimes, in some places in the state of California. Uh, the, the backdrop to that, since you asked about data and statistics, is uh, we remain in historic lows when it comes to the crime rate. But, but from those historic lows, there are um, some spikes in, in violent crime. And almost all of it, 90% of it, is fueled by guns, by gun violence. You cannot talk about violent crime in California without talking about gun violence. And if our, our leaders, uh, and we are focused on this, a thousand percent in the California Department of Justice must be focused on addressing gun violence, right, uh, so which underlies the, these, these crimes. So let's talk about the ways that you're thinking about approaching this. Um, is it getting illegal guns off the streets? Is it holding those who uh, either produce or distribute those guns or those who fire those guns responsible somehow? Uh, talk about the different things being considered and being worked on. It's all of the above. So we're, we're starting uh, with prevention, um, red flag laws, gun violence restraining orders, which allow for, uh, with due process and a court order, guns to be removed from the hands of someone who would do harm to themselves or to others. Um, supporting and expanding programs, um, violence intervention programs like ceasefire and peacekeepers, which are uh, known to successfully intervene in uh, high crime um, areas uh, with deep interventions with the uh, relatively few who are responsible for the majority of violent crime and intervening in a way that reduces the crime in places like Stockton by by half. We're also removing guns from the hands of those who are prohibited from having them with our unique in the nation, uh, first and only of its kind, armed prohibited person system. Uh, we are um, uh, doing deep investigations with surveillance, sophisticated investigations, and taking down organized criminal uh, organizations that are trafficking uh, guns and engaged in uh, gun violence, and including we have stopped uh, murders that were in the process of, of occurring. We have prevented them and disrupted them uh, in real time. Um, we are defending our common sense gun laws in court, like our assault weapons ban, our large capacity magazine ban, and we're supporting additional laws that will help create a- accountability and greater safety in our neighborhoods and communities like AB 1594, which uh, holds uh, distributors and manufacturers of guns uh, responsible uh, to make sure they don't get into the hands of those who should not have them. So, and we're suing ghost gun manufacturers, ghost guns, a, a more recent uh, but significant threat to-, to safety when it comes to gun violence. Uh, we're suing uh, gun manufacturers for um, their involvement in in allowing ghost guns to be on our streets and in our communities and our neighborhoods. So we are very active in 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 in, in many areas that can help address gun violence and keep our community safe. So let's talk about that, the the allowing citizens to file civil lawsuits uh, against gun manufacturers and distributors. Is this sort of modeled after the Texas law allowing citizens to sue anyone who somehow aided in an abortion? That's a a separate law that I had not yet mentioned. It's uh, being authored by Senator uh, Bob Hertzberg here in the state of California. Hmm. And it is modeled after the um, SB8 in Texas, but also very different. Um, It's similar in the sense that it allows for a private right of action Uh, meaning it allows an individual to sue another individual for a certain conduct. But uh, in Texas, uh, it was used to under 
undermine um, a constitutional right, a, a, the, the constitutional right to an abortion, and, and individuals uh, were allowed to sue others for exercising that constitutional right. Here in, in California, uh, with Senator Hertzberg's bill, his bill is designed to um, uh, not to undermine any constitutional right, but actually to keep our communities safe, so, um, uh, to protect life and protect communities by allowing for suits against those who have assault weapons or high uh, caliber uh, firearms or ghost guns. Some feel a sense of futility in that, you know, we're looking at California already having some of the toughest gun restriction laws in the country, um, yet this still happens here. Is the solution in working with other states? Are you exploring and perhaps already working with other states' attorneys general to, to do something collectively? Uh, yes, uh, there is a need for uh, other states to act. The federal government to act as well. President Biden has pushed for common sense gun laws and Congress unfortunately has not cooperated with him at this point. But it is important for the federal government to, to act more boldly, for other states to act uh, more aggressively, for more states and the federal government to uh, conform with and do what California has done. California is a leader in the nation when it comes to common sense gun laws. And as a result, we have one of the lowest firearm mortality rates in the nation. Those things go hand in hand. One is because of the other. And if other states did the same, uh, we would have an enhanced safety uh, when it comes to gun violence. We, of course, have um, borders where individuals can appropriately freely cross them. And if individuals buy guns in other states and bring them into California when they would have been prohibited from doing so in California, that is a problem. So uh, we're in this together. We are interrelated. Uh, we are connected. And if the federal government, for example, had universal background checks, a ban on high capacity magazines, on assault weapons, um, uh, invested more deeply in proven violence uh, intervention programs like ceasefire and peacekeepers, we'd all be safer. What about more or perhaps different policing or prosecution? Is that part of the equation too? Yes, uh, I mean, we're always looking to uh, improve safety. Uh, public safety is job number one for me as California Attorney General. It is fundamental, it's foundational. Uh, every person in California and every person in this country deserves a safe neighborhood, a safe community, um, you know, to be safe. I've gone all over the, the state of California, met individuals from um, north to south and inland and rural and coastal, and um, and I have never met anyone who wants to be the victim of a crime. Uh, I, I've been the victim of a violent crime. I do not wish that uh, for me or for anyone uh, else. Mm -hmm. And it is important. We know that the biggest deterrent uh, to crime, what prevents crime from happening, is knowing that you will be caught if you commit a crime. So we need to uh, arrest people and hold them accountable when they violate the law and hurt and harm others. And so um, uh, being able to uh, hold individuals account when they um, are engaged in gun violence uh, is absolutely uh, critical. Okay. Um, of course, you've heard the phrase, guns don't kill people, um, people do. Do you think there's also more to ending the gun violence than, um, you know, taking these measures via restricting guns? For example, people talk about mental health, uh, medical, improving socioeconomics and opportunities for people, uh, education. Does that all go hand in hand here? Let me first address the issue regarding the statement that you said. Um, I, I think that um, misses some really important data about how it, how successful uh, and impactful common sense gun laws are. Um, if an individual wants to harm someone, but they have only access to you know their their hands or um, a, a less lethal weapon than a than a firearm. Um, even a knife. Yeah, you, they might not be able to hurt as many people or an individual as severely. So the, the restrictions that we have on guns are, are absolutely critical. They, they, they are without a doubt in, incontrovertibly, um, indisputably impactful and effective, and we need to continue doing what keeps us safe. And um, yes, deep interventions and investments in communities um, uh, make, make us safer. E educational opportunity, upward mobility, economic opportunity, jobs, job training, uh, greater health care access, uh, addressing poverty, um, a strong social service safety net. Um, you know, all of those things uh, help create uh, thriving communities um, that are um, free or, or uh, of, of violence, including violence with firearms. All right, State Attorney General Rob Bonta, thank you so very much for weighing in today. Really appreciate the conversation. Honored to be with you. Thank you for having me.
Coming up next, is downtown San Francisco forever changed by the pandemic? Our media partner, the San Francisco Standard, takes a closer look at the past, the present, and what could be the future for Salesforce Tower and the area. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed this lovely shot of cruise ships. <laughs> the cruise ships are back. Next segment, here we go. ABC7 is excited about our partnership with the digital news site, The San Francisco Standard. The Standard's focus on hyper-local quality of life issues aligns with ABC7's efforts to build a better Bay Area. Today, The Standard is focusing on the effort to revitalize downtown San Francisco two years after it was hit by the pandemic, specifically the area around Salesforce Tower, which was once a bustling neighborhood uh, and really financial center. Joining us now is SF Standard data editor, Anna Tong. Anna, uh, thanks for joining us today. You lead a team of reporters um, in this, really diving into what's happening around Salesforce Tower, the transit center, and the surrounding area. What was your goal in doing this? Yeah, so everyone really wants to know what's happening with downtown. That's really a big question on everyone's mind in San Francisco. And so we just decided to do a deep dive on a truly iconic tower in San Francisco, Salesforce Tower, one that everyone's seen and knows about to kind of try to figure out what the future of downtown SF will look like. All right, um, and of course this reporting comes at a time when Salesforce and other big companies are trying to bring employees back in the office, right? Fighting a tide of office workers who feel remote or hybrid has worked just fine, right? Um, so, you know, that's kind of a push and pull and a struggle there. Where are things right now? Yeah, so in terms of the tenants, we were able to interview tenants that comprised about 85% of the tower, and we really found that they're really not coming back to work full time. Hmm. And Salesforce Tower isn't just tech, it's also law firms, consulting firms, etc. Um, there's a WeWork there as well. And we found that the tenants are planning to ask their workers to come back between zero and three days a week. All right. And uh, any percentages in terms of uh, willingness to do so? And, and maybe did you take a look at how San Francisco compares to other big cities? Um, we did not take a look specifically about how SF compares to other big cities, but there's been um, consistent stories um, using castle card entry where they've really shown that SF is lagging behind other big cities in terms of um, office reentry. Got it. Okay, so if people are only going to be there one day, two days, three days, that's a lot of money not dropped on restaurants in the area, retail. So how about those shops and restaurants? Did you look at those and how they fared during the pandemic and where we are? Yes, we did. So we did a deep dive onto this one block that's right off of Salesforce Tower on Mission Street. And what we found was 
pretty depressing. So mm -hmm. out of all the retail, we found that approximately half um, were closed during COVID. All of the restaurants, the sit down restaurants were closed. Yeah. So everything from a, a casual lunchtime eatery to a fancy place where you take your clients. Um, and so some of like the takeout places, they were closed during COVID and they had reopened, but it was pretty sad, like foot traffic, they said sales were down 50%. You know, there was this one bakery owner, she said she sells 10 cookies a day. And before it was all tons of office parties, birthday cakes, et cetera. So mm. the situation was pretty dire. Let's not forget there's also a transit center there. Um, how about yeah. the buses and the commuting? Is that coming back? Yes. So also depressing. Um, so we looked at AC Transit, which is the largest bus agency that's operating out of Salesforce Transit, and their ridership's down almost 90% compared to before COVID. Okay. So it's down, yeah, down 88%, I believe. Okay. So there's the, what was happening before, what is happening now, but what do we think will happen in the future? Um, do these companies and businesses have a sense that people will eventually come back more or nope, things are never going to go back to that. So we have to find a different way. Yeah, so that's a big question. I mean, we talked to um, Nick Bloom. He's a Stanford economics professor, and he um, he studies specifically working from home. And what he thinks is that things are really, truly never going to be the same downtown um, and that we just need to adapt to this new way of working, which is that office, certain office workers are only going to come in max three days a week. And SF really needs to drastically rethink what we're going to be doing with downtown. Right. I mean, with all that capacity, I guess, in space. What are some yeah. of the ideas? I mean, is there the sense that, yeah. hey, if not techies and bankers, somebody else will come in and fill the void and maybe that creates new opportunities? Exactly. So what he was saying was it's actually not necessarily a bad thing unless you're the city SF of SF and you're relying on tax revenue or your commercial landlord. For everyone else, it might actually be good. We might see, I mean, in 2019, everyone was complaining about how expensive and overcrowded SF was, but we might see a return to SF from 10 or 15 years ago where things were actually more affordable and you know um, an hourly worker can actually afford to live near their job instead of having to commute in from very far away. So that might actually be a good thing for a lot of people. All right, I'm good with the traffic of 15 years ago. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think a exactly. lot of people might be, right? Um, okay, what are some of the other ideas in the meantime to make the area thrive again? What are some of the carrots being dangled? Yeah, so the mayor's got a new initiative called Bloom SF, and so that was a whole week of events um, last week where, that were centered around um, downtown um, Salesforce Transit Park. Um, if you've been, it's this beautiful urban park that's on top of the transit center. It's five and a half acres. They're doing a bunch of free programming, so they're going to have a beer garden there. There's going to be a restaurant there. Um, they have this amphitheater, and they do a lot of shows. They do yoga that's free. They have, like, toddler Tuesdays and stuff like that, so... That area is really just trying to like ramp up its events to just really attract um, foot traffic back there. Well, Anna, I have to say part of what I enjoyed about this particular story is really the way you presented it. Uh, it certainly made the data very easy to digest. So I really do invite people to check it out. Thank you so much, Anna Tong, SF Standards Data Editor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. By the way, folks, if you go to abc7news.com, you will definitely see a whole section on original reporting from the San Francisco Standard. Uh, again, they are our media partner, and we invite you to check it out. All right, it's known as the toughest bicycle race in the world. Nope, not the Tour de France, but a Bay Area man crossed the finish line, and now there's a documentary about his 3,000-mile journey. We're talking to the cyclist at the center of the film and his wife, the producer.
The race across America is a nearly non-stop bike ride from coast to coast, winding through deserts, mountain ranges, and everything in between. It's 30% longer, actually, than the Tour de France, and accomplished in half the amount of time, so you can imagine how much you got to ride each day. An extreme athlete from Palo Alto embarked on this 3,000-mile adventure, and there's a new documentary out about his grueling journey. I can't understand or even comprehend that somebody can ride their bike this far this fast. You know, extreme heat, extreme climbing, extreme everything. You wake up and you're like, oh, I have 20 minutes to get back on the bike. The documentary is called Until the Wheels Come Off, and you can watch it right now on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, and more. Joining us now, the cyclist who's the star of the film, John Tarleton, and his wife, Jenny Dearborn, who also produced the film. Uh, John and Jenny, thank you for coming on the show today. Oh, I think you might have to unmute your mic or something, because I see your lovely faces, I see your mouths moving, but I don't hear you. Try now. Uh, there you go. Yes. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's a little more high tech than a bike, right? But uh, John, what inspired you to do this race? I think you did it in 2019, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but what inspired you to, to take on this challenge? Yeah, so um, the crew and I did the race in 2014 ah. and um, we finished, um, but at the end of the race, we, we looked at each other and said, you know, we could probably do this better, faster. And so our goal in 2019 was actually to win. Oh, to win. Okay. And I thought it was also to raise money for cancer research, right? Indeed. Indeed. Yes. To raise money for Stanford Cancer Institute. Okay, for those who don't know about this race, I mean, we've all heard of the Tour de France, but not necessarily about the race across America. Is the whole purpose of it to allow participants to raise money? That's certainly part of it. Uh, all, all of the writers that I know of are raising money for a, a nonprofit of some sort or another. Got it. All right. Not really important, but just the curiosity factor, because we're wondering, you know, if you're writing that much, you got to be really fit. What's your day job? My, my day job is uh, to support a team of people in commercial real estate doing life science properties. Got it. So it's not exactly something physical fitness related. Um, okay, so walk us through the race. Uh, where did it start? Where did it take you? Where did it end? The most challenging parts, all of it. Yeah, so the race starts in Oceanside, California, uh, and it winds its way across the country and ends in Annapolis, Maryland. Okay, so I'm going to ask Jenny here because you had the camera going the whole time. You were cheering him on, but also filming for the documentary. Um, what were some of the most harrowing moments that you saw? Were there moments when you were, you know, worried about him? Like, I had to put down this camera and help him? I, I was worried about him the entire time. It was um, the most stressful experience of my life to watch him. He... Um, from the vibrations on the bike, his, he had nerve damage in his arms. And so he couldn't steer his bike because he couldn't control his arms. Um, his neck muscles give out. And so he can't lift his head. And how can you steer your bike to avoid oncoming traffic when you can't steer or see? Right. It's incredible. It was incredibly stressful. Yeah. And he, it was almost 130 degrees in Arizona and he's riding his bike and from heat exhaustion he's also throwing up so he can't keep liquids inside of him to cool himself because he's so overheated that he I, I mean we just thought I had to call and you know a helicopter ambulance at every moment it was so stressful okay it sounds like it was just the most difficult experience ever did you win we did not. We did not. Uh, In his own way, he won because he finished. <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, by my calculations, really rough. If you're talking about 3,000 miles, 12 days, that's like 250 miles more than a double century a day, which is nuts. Um, we got to go, but congratulations on, you know, this experience and the documentary. It's called Until the Wheels Come Off, and we invite our viewers to check it out. Stick with us. We'll continue to chat on Facebook Live. We'll be right back. All right, um, we have about two more minutes. We're off air, but we're still streaming. So I want to ask you, um, 
would you, I guess, would you do it again? I mean, as difficult as it was, you've done it twice now, would you try it a third time? Who knows? At this point, we're, we're not talking about doing it again. With his next wife, maybe, not with me. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, so, Jenny, what do you hope viewers will take away from watching uh, Until the Wheels Come Off? Um, well, it really is a story about um, a family and how they pull together. I mean, our um, three kids were part of his crew, and they had to be the ones pushing their dad on and saying, I know you've ridden your bike for 36 hours, but you got to keep going because they're calculating how much he needs to ride each day and at what speed to get to the checkpoints in time so that he's not disqualified and that he's able to finish. And, and um, so it was incredibly heartbreaking for me as a mom to watch my kids, you know, ignore the pain mm -hmm. and the and the suffering that their dad was clearly going through and just turn that off and push him mm. it, so that in the end he could achieve his goals because yep. he's just he's just brainless right he's just a pair of legs yep. you're just, just going like you're just a machine yeah yep. he's just a, he's just a machine and yep. he's not making any decisions <laughs> and my kids are the ones making Got the decisions for oh what him. a great and experience it, hey we almost have to go but i want to get our viewer question in who helps you map out your route so you know you're not riding into dangerous territory is that the kids or is that established by the race organizers the route is established by the race organizers, yeah. Got it. Okay, so at least the kids didn't have to worry about that part. Uh, John and Jenny, pleasure meeting you. Congratulations once again. Uh, just amazing feat, and I hope people will check it out until the wheels come off. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, thank you for joining us on this interactive show, Getting Answers. We'll be here every weekday at 3 on air and on live stream answering your questions. World News Tonight with David Muir is coming up next. Have a great day.